pulmonary radiographs. I basically uh, decided to just concentrate on pulmonary patterns. Uh, otherwise, there's just too much that happens in the chest. So I thought this would be good board preparation though to just see some classic patterns and put them all together into the appropriate differentials. All right, our first one is a classic left upper lobe atelectasis. You can see the atelectatic left upper lobe that will drop out uh, laterally and anteriorly as it loses volume. There's also a big mass there in the hilar region and significant volume loss on the left, right? The trachea is shifting and there is a mass with actual tapering of the left mainstem bronchus visible. Lateral is actually very helpful on this as well, and we'll get to that in a sec. There is the atelectatic lung, the tracheal shift, very nicely demonstrated, and there you can see the tapering bronchus and a large mass that most likely is circumferential around that bronchus. So the lateral is very helpful. You can see there's the left upper lobe collapsing. It's actually not very far gone. Uh, when it is completely atelectatic, that'll disappear into just a thin band of density right up against the anterior chest wall. In addition, you've got that typical clear space back around seven o'clock uh, that is filled in with soft tissue density here and a definite sign of a hilar mass or adenopathy. So there is that atelectatic lung and there is that lack of a normal clear space indicating a mass. So that one is a left upper lobe atelectasis. All right, this is another consolidation, but with air bronchograms, so not post-obstructive atelectasis. You don't see the same volume loss that we saw in the previous. This is interesting mainly because of the underlying cause. Certainly, this is pretty nonspecific. It could be uh, an overwhelming pneumonia. It could even be a bad lung contusion. Uh, what this was, was a pregnant woman who had infectious endocarditis. And this is the classic appearance of mitral valve regurgitation. So they will burst a papillary muscle, have a flail mitral valve, and go pretty quickly into fulminant right lung pulmonary edema. The interesting thing in looking this up you'll find that the right upper lobe is typically predominantly involved. And that makes anatomic sense. You can imagine if you lost your mitral valve, your every left ventricular contraction would blow things right up the right upper lobe pulmonary veins. Um, in practice, I have not found that to be the case. In fact, I have three of these in my teaching file and all three look exactly like this one. Well, this is an old one. You can see uh, lacking for resolution, but it's a, it's a good one to evaluate from a differential standpoint. This is pure alveolar density, the classic uh, perihilar bat wing alveolar density. There is no interstitial component. There's no prominence of the vasculature. And if we look in actually higher resolution at a bronchus, that's a big bronchus and yet a relatively thin wall. So no peribronchial cuffing. Uh, in addition to all the findings we mentioned. So this could be a lot of things. Certainly it could be a pneumonia. It could be a typical pneumonia. It could be early congestive heart failure. Typically in that setting, I, I would think about the uh, extreme hypertensive presentations like renal artery stenosis. That can definitely give you this kind of flash pulmonary edema. But in this case, there is the helping tidbit here of a trauma board. So in the setting of trauma, that changes everything. I start thinking near drowning, perhaps inhalational injury, or this. This patient had a devastating head injury from which he did not recover. And this was almost immediate pulmonary edema uh, related to that injury. Interestingly, this is not like ARDS. This is not humoral inflammatory mediator effects. This is in fact uh, neurogenically, neurophysiologically mediated and happens almost instantaneously after a head injury instead of the 48 or more hour delay you typically see with ARDS. All right, our next one, patchy involvement throughout, and that is the key. Uh, there are basically all the pulmonary findings here. We've got airspace density, we've got interstitial prominence, peribronchovascular thickening, and even areas of air trapping 
interspersed throughout. Let's take a closer look at that. You can see those bronchial walls are actually thicker than that large bronchus we looked at earlier. So this is clearly peribronchial cuffing. Uh, there is prominent interstitium and again, air trapping mixed with alveolar density. This was a funny one because I was in private practice up in Spokane and certainly there is a, there is a significant agricultural presence up there. And this was one where the attending was concerned enough. This guy was wheezing such you could hear him down the hallway. The attending came in and handed me the film and said, what do you think of this? And I looked at it and said, what's this guy do? And no kidding, the attending said, he's a silo filler. So they uh, called it silo filler's disease. And uh, that's exactly what this was. So this is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Uh, basically, uh, I think they've described three or 400 different allergens that can kick this off. In the case of silos, it's usually aspergillus, uh, and people have implicated some nitrogen gases building up as well. All right, our next one. Pretty subtle, but there it is. It is right upper lobe, ground glass density. This is a case of PCP. Don't say PCP pneumonia, because that second P stands for pneumonia. Right? So a very nice example of how subtle ground glass density can be. I, I had it explained to me once. Uh, it's like looking at someone behind one of those frosted shower doors. Uh, you can see that there's something there, but you can't make out detail. So you're kind of losing the lung detail that you would expect to see and that you, in fact, can see in the left upper lobe. This is an old one of mine. This uh, nipple ring in, in my day was supposed to suggest an alternative lifestyle. In this day and age, of course, uh, piercings, tattoos, they're no longer of diagnostic uh, quality information. So I'm showing my age. All right, this next one, this is a great pattern to recognize. In fact, I'll stop for a second and say my old friend, uh, my old friend Chris, his dad was a board examiner, was a famous radiologist, and he said he couldn't believe how few radiologists think of failure uh, when they come to the boards and are shown a classic uh, perihilar interstitial prominence with uh, plump vasculature. Uh, you know, everybody is thinking of such weirdness that they forget to think of the obvious. So in addition to the perihilar hairiness that we see there, uh, keep an eye out for this on the boards. They love to catch you out on uh, catheter placement and uh, tubes, lines, hoses, all of that. And that is an aortic balloon pump marker that is far too high, should be down below the lower aspect of the aortic knob. In addition, some diagnostic aid is given you by the presence of this catheter. You can see it's a Swan-Gans catheter, pulmonary artery catheter, that has been placed through a femoral approach. You are not going to see that outside of the cath lab. Uh, I, in fact, tried to debunk that, and I remember spending an entire night in the ICU trying to float a pulmonary artery catheter through a groin uh, under fluoro, and it's impossible. So if you see that, you know that patient came from the cath lab. So let's look in more detail. That sort of shaggy, hairy appearance to the perihilar vasculature, you've got peribronchial cuffing. I think you can see it up here and down here, even though the resolution is suffering a bit, right? Just a classic perihilar interstitial edema. And again, there's that aortic balloon pump marker and the catheter coming up from a femoral approach. So this is an acute myocardial infarction with hypotension and congestive heart failure. All right, our next one. Oops, sorry. This is a classic reticulonodular pattern. We'll see that much better on the blow up view. Uh, I love reticulonodular or uh, peribronchovascular for that matter uh, pattern because the differential is really relatively short. It's lymphangitic metastases or tumor spread, uh, Kaposi sarcoma sarcoidosis. And in this case, if you look down in the left upper quadrant, there it is, a big gastroesophageal tumor that has given rise to all these mets throughout the interstitium. So let's look more closely. Dr. Jim Standen told me once, when you just can't tell what's going on, right? There's so much lung involvement that it all gets white. Look to the edge, look to the edge of the involved area and you'll be able to determine the pattern. 
So I think this is the critical point right here, is this line with those little nodules all along it, they look like ants on a log or berries on a vine. Uh, that's the appearance you're looking for. So that is uh, peribronchovascular or reticular nodular. And then there is the large soft tissue mass, clearly denoting gastroesophageal tumor. All right, our next one. And this is another example of such extensive involvement, right? In the center here, you've just got white. So what you'll need to do is look to the edge before you can really determine what's causing this. In addition, there's kind of a dominant nodule here, which is of diagnostic assistance, I think, once you determine the pattern. So look again to the edges of the involved area, and I think you'll appreciate this is actually micronodularity. This can be a tough, tough call to make, but these are all micronodules. This is miliary spread. Uh, certainly, there are tumors that can do this. I've seen thyroid and melanoma have a very similar appearance to this. Uh, but you see this, you're typically thinking TB and COXI. And I think that's especially the case when you've got a giant dominant nodule like this that suggests an original focus of infection. Uh, once you get it down to TB and COXI, just look for mediastinal calcifications. With TB, you'll probably have them. With COXI, you almost certainly won't. So that is this case of coccidioidomycosis. And that is a miliary spread or micronodular pattern. All right, our next one also came to me from Dr. Jim Standen. And this is tough, at least in the right lung, they're just these ill-defined kind of wispy densities. Honestly, could be anything, right? Foci of bronchopneumonia, maybe nodules or mets, but uh, you know, for, from the ill-defined characteristics there, I'd, I'd be uh, more inclined to just call this a uh, little foci of infection or inflammation. But up here, there is the, the winner, right? That cavity, and we'll look more closely at it because its particular characteristic is what's helpful here. So they're nonspecific airspace densities, but here, look how that cavity is forming and it's leaving, it's kind of shelling out and almost retracting back from its wall. And that particular appearance is strongly suggestive of septic embolization. In fact, I remember Dr. Stanton pulling this off the view box and handing it to me and saying, you're gonna want that. And sure enough, it was septic emboli. All right, our last one in pulmonary patterns. This is an interstitial disease. You can see down here in the lower lobe, I think it's best depicted. I always think of chondroid matrix when I look at interstitial disease in the lungs. It looks the same to me, a bunch of loops and arcs, right? In addition, hope you picked up the pneumo. They love to slip these in in the boards, right? And there's actually, if you look on the surface of the lung, there's sort of a lobulated appearance to it as though there is a stiffness to the underlying lung architecture, again, consistent with there being interstitial disease. And the thing that really helps you make the diagnosis is AP window adenopathy. You can't see the aorta separate from the left PA here in the AP window. Uh, and that adenopathy basically helps you say, this is a case of sarcoidosis. So this is pretty advanced sarcoidosis. There is the interstitial involvement. Again, rings and arcs. Look at that lobulated surface on the pneumothorax there. And lastly, AP window adenopathy. So that's a case of sarcoidosis with interstitial disease. And that concludes our pulmonary radiograph patterns.